Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lincoln Bryant, who is a researcher at the Enrico Fermi Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's also uh, part of uh, Rob Gardner's group at the University of Chicago. And he's um, one of the maintainers of, a, um, of the Atlas Tier 2 facility at the University of Chicago. So they have something like uh, uh, several tens of thousands of cores that are maintained for the High Energy Physics uh, Atlas project. So he's been part of the Slate CI project since its inception, and he's going to give us um, a background on that project and how it relates to uh, providing distributed services at multiple sites and any updates that uh, the folks in the Slate CI project have embarked on in the past year or two. Go ahead, Lincoln. Okay, thanks, Robert. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, can everybody see that? All good? Looks good. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so my presentation is uh, building a platform for distributed federated operations. Um, sort of the outline of this talk um, is that first I'm going to kind of go into um, what uh, what I mean by federated operations and this kind of policy model that we've we've built up um, for building distributed platforms. Um, our particular implementation of this model, which we call Slate, um, some examples of real world Slate usage and how this might integrate into the NERSC environment and uh, some other ideas for the future. Um, and so the motivation behind this is that when you have these research collaborations um, that span multiple institutions, um, you know, typically they, they may have something like, um, you know, experiment facilities that are, that are gathering data, you know, they need to work with other facilities that are doing, you know, simulation and analysis, they need a, a task system over top of that that can uh, coordinate that, that submission to different sites. Um, and then they need, you know, good, good networks and, and tools to, to move data around. Um, and, and building such a system is kind of daunting if you're starting from scratch. Um, there's, you know, a lot of people involved in this. Um, you know, you have the, the developers of the software that you're going to be using. You have all of the system administrators involved. Um, you know, you have all the project management and coordination that needs to happen. Um, there are a lot of um, administrative domains you have to cross. And by that, I mean that there's a lot of different institutional uh, boundaries in terms of things like policy, um, that you have to kind of meet the, the policy requirements of all the institutions where you're planning to do some computing. Um, and there's also, you know, if you can get through that, uh, there's a lot of diverse uh, diversity in the technology stacks, right? Um, you know, people are running different operating systems and different you know, storage technologies and, and all sorts of things. Um, and so supposing you could, you could get all of that together, um, you then have to maintain it. Um, and coordinating updates across several sites can be really challenging. Um, you have to maintain compatibility across a large range of software versions. Um, you know, in my little cartoon here, I have, you know, four different sites that are running three different versions of some data lake software. Um, and so any clients that talk to those data lakes would then have to be compatible with all the different versions. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, monitoring the whole thing, responding to outages, res responding to you know, vulnerabilities, uh, things like that uh, can be really difficult. And uh, ju just to show that I'm not making this uh, totally up, it's not all just in my head, uh, this is a real problem that we have. Um, and so in, in the worldwide LHC computing grid, um, the WLCG, um, we have several experiments uh, that are at CERN on the LHC uh, that are taking data at a you know, facility we call the, the tier zero. And then there's a number of other sort of tier one facilities, um, you know, national lab uh, sort of scale, uh, centers that you know have you know tape copies of data and they're doing all this batch processing. Then we have another layer of this onion um, where we have uh, tier two centers that are doing simulation and analysis. They also have large attached data stores, you know, on the order of you know ten petabytes. Um, and then you have sort of the classic, you know, um, cluster in a closet. Uh, what we call it, a tier three institution, um, you know, which are running these small clusters that are in support of their local, you know, physics group. 
Um, and then we, of course, have these large HPC centers like NERSC, um, which can provide us really substantial amounts of computing, but then we have to adapt our workloads to fit um, on their supercomputers. And so somehow um, we have to be using you know, essentially all the same services. We have to run approximately the same software um, and we have to do it all within a single global uh, namespace for data. Um, and so how do we address these challenges? Um, we kind of thought of, of, of three uh, pillars for, for how one might do this. Um, the first one is to, to take the science DMZ pattern, which we think has been really successful in kind of lowering the, the barrier to access for data uh, between institutions. Um, and we extend it to include this secure and uh, transparently operated platform for running long lived services. We, within that platform, have this catalog of applications that are trusted by resource providers and that also gives resource providers fine-grained control over who can run things and what they can run. And ultimately, uh, we shift some of the responsibility away from um, system administrators at sites to learn how to use you know, various pieces of, of bespoke services um, and, and shift that instead over to uh, the, the experts that, that wrote, in many instances, these services, uh, and let them run it on behalf of their collaboration at you know, uh, uh, many different sites. Um, and so what's changed to make this possible? Um, you know, I think historically, it would have been really challenging um, and in, in, in many cases not possible uh, to, to give users the ability to run some kind of application, um, especially one that needed privileged ports, things like that, uh, to, to run those applications uh, somewhere in your infrastructure because you'd have to give them root access somewhere. Um, you know, and that might be root access on a piece of hardware, that might be root access in VM or whatever. Um, and I think what's changed fundamentally uh, as, as things like Kubernetes and Docker and, and those sorts of things have come along, um, that there are now sort of these a la carte uh, containerization and capability subsystems, uh, specifically in Linux. Um, and in and, and using those, you can sort of uh, grant, you know, particular pieces of minimal privilege to your users uh, to let them stand up applications. I had some actual real direct experiment experience with this um, when I was using uh, SPIN the other day. I was going through the SPIN training and uh, I think it has you set up like a MySQL database. And one of the things that you do uh, as part of setting up that database is you select all the capabilities that you need um, for that database in order to run. Um, and so I think this is kind of ultimately been the, the driving factor uh, behind this paradigm shift where we now have you know, these Kubernetes uh, clusters popping up all over the place. We have uh, developers using those clusters. Um, and for our, our scientific collaborations, um, you know, it's, it's now kind of opened the door uh, to building a multi-institutional uh, federation of services. And so, um, while we you know, realize that you know, what we want to do is now technically possible in many places, um, there are still some significant policy work that has to be kind of um, you know, thought through and, and standardized. Um, in particular, uh, what we found with working with organizations is that the, you know, so the security, uh, cybersecurity groups within these organizations um, really voice that they need the ability to scrutinize and kind of introspect uh, things that are running on their network. And so that means that, that you know, any kind of service that is hosting containers um, or, or whatever uh, needs to provide some specific tools and policies um, for your cybersecurity people to be able to do things like traceability and auditability, like if there's incidents, you know, how do incidents get responded to? How can they do assessment? of the applications that you want to run on the network, um, that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, we, we work with, with these security orgs and they also you know, said that you know, the things that they, they need are really the ability to grant and revoke authorization. Um, they ultimately want to be able to control you know, what's being run on their network, who's running it and for how long. 
And so with the Slate team, we worked with um, Trusted CI in 2018 and 2019 um, to establish this uh, groundwork for a trust framework um, and set of policies for implementing what ultimately we would call federated operations. And we now have ongoing work with CERN and the, and the WLCG to, to develop this further. And that's sort of the, the kind of policy outline. Um, the mechanism that we use to implement this is, uh, is called SLATE, and that stands for Services Layer at the Edge. Um, it is a Kubernetes-based uh, service management platform uh, for multi-institutional collaborations. Uh, and the idea is that um, you know, resource providers can come to SLATE, they have some Kubernetes cluster, they can register it in SLATE, then it becomes part of the federation, and um, folks that are uh, users of Slate can then deploy applications on those facilities. And so uh, to do that, an another kind of key piece was this uh, curated application catalog. And so the idea is that as part of the Slate project, one of the things that we would do is build a catalog of, of uh, software that's sort of relevant for our community, um, you know, things like, you know, personars and globuses and you know uh, caches of various flavors and that kind of thing um, and what we would try to do then is to make it very simple um, to deploy upgrade and maintain those applications at uh, various sites that are part of our fabric and we would build out a policy and process um, to sort of you know establish what it means to be a, a trustworthy application um, and, and overall, we've been taking a declarative approach to application deployment. We really want users to not think about things in terms of, um, you know, Kubernetes objects and things like that. We really want users to think about things in terms of how much memory and CPU do I need to run my application? What, uh, what ports need to be exposed to the network? And what IPs am I going to allow to access it? And that sort of thing. Um, and so the Slate architecture, uh, is, is kind of in this little cartoon here on the right. Um, fundamentally, what you have is, you know, uh, various clusters out there in the world, and they're tied together by this component that we call the API server. Um, essentially, when you set up a Slate cluster, you install a component called the Federation Controller. That's a little operator for, for Kubernetes that gives um, the Slate API the ability to call into your cluster and gives it the minimum privileges needed um, to create namespaces on behalf of user groups that you have granted to use your cluster. Um, and so, um, for example, if you, you know, I'm in the, the, with the Atlas experiment, and so I want to run this application called Xcache, and so, you know, I have this Atlas Xcache group, um, you know, I, I email you or whatever as a, as a cluster administrator, and I ask, can you please add my group to your cluster so I can deploy this application? Um, and we give uh, in Slate a very fine-grained um, ability to say, okay, yes, you can you can deploy this application uh, and only for your group. Um, and then the API server exposes um, essentially a RESTful API for clients to interact with it. And the API server um, links together users who come in through our portal. Um, they come in and sign in with their institutional identity. Um, it associates those users to groups and it tracks running application instances. And so any user that comes into Slate um, can do things like four clusters uh, on which they have access. They can launch, update, and delete instances. They can do things like control the amount of uh, replicas for a particular instance that they're running. Um, they can look at configurations. Um, they can look at logs. In some instances, they can look at monitoring if you know, the appropriate plugins are installed, uh, that sort of thing. And so kind of under the hood, um, Slate is using Kubernetes namespaces, secrets, and, uh, and role-based access control. So the API server is granted access only to its own subset of namespaces. So Slate can't really reach out and touch other namespaces. And importantly, uh, Slate isolates users uh, from each other just by using the, the sort of native Kubernetes namespace functionality. And that's all done by this component that runs on the, on the cluster um, that we call the Federation Controller, also called the NRP Controller. Um, and so how the Slate permission model works, 
Um, essentially, what Slate is trying to do is um, make it possible for uh, resource providers to share access to their clusters um, with well-known groups. And um, essentially, all resources and objects in Slate are associated with the group. And so um, as a cluster owner, you can go and register a cluster. Um, and, and Slate will give you the ability to launch applications on your own cluster as you know that, that administering group. Um, I think that, yeah, that's over here. Um, so if you're some organization, you federate a cluster with the Slate platform. Um, the only thing that Slate allows you to do sort of right off the bat is to allow other members of your organization to deploy applications on your cluster. Um, so it's kind of a, an opt-in model rather than, a, than an opt-out. Um, and so then if another organization comes along um, and they say, oh, I would like to deploy applications on your cluster, uh, you can grant them the permission to uh, run applications there. Um, either you know, they can run any application in the catalog or they can only run sort of the specific application that you allow. Um, Thank you. Can we interrupt you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there was a question from Ayush about um, Active Directory and whether it um, integrates or how it exactly integrates. Yeah, so this is this is kind of uh, above the level of the institutional like Active Directory. This this uses um, ultimately Globus and, and CI Logon. Um, so it, it goes through that that path uh, to be registered in the Slate Federation because this is um you know th this federation exists over multiple institutions um you can potentially integrate active directory into applications um i think that can all be facilitated through something like sssd but i'm i'm not an i'm not an ad expert um but that would happen kind of at the application level okay um so just uh, yeah. hey can you sure. hear me yeah so just just to follow up on that, um, so does it does it means that uh, it, it maintains its own kind of directory structure or kind of a replica of Active Directory? Um, there's not really any Active Directory necessarily involved in in Slate, um, so we're just pulling um, the the relevant identity information from your institution by way of CI logon. Um, and so, yeah, we, I mean, we do, we do keep a record of like, um, if you, if you log into the Slate portal, we keep things like, uh, you know, this is your, your institutional identity. This is your, your Globus identity. We keep some, some attributes. Um, and then we have our own sort of internal organization of, of groups and, and things like that. That's what the, the Slate API does. So is it, is it like you also keep a map of, like users, their identities and their roles and groups associations, and then distribute it to the worker nodes on the institution? Um, so what happens at the institutional level is that um, the, the, the Kubernetes cluster at the institution only sees uh, groups. And so users are sort of aggregated in groups. And so any user that's in a group is, uh, that, that's sort of flat. Um, so if a group is allowed to deploy applications on your cluster, anybody in that group is allowed to deploy applications. Um, if you want things more fine grained than that, you know, you need to build more fine grained groups, essentially. So an another just, I'm just um, a quick last question. So sure. let's say I have an application uh, deployed from my group on the institution level, and then I want to share it to another group at another institution. So like, do I do I have to expose it toward from, from the slate, and like do I also need to do some I would say codes some work to to share that on the slate side? So, yeah, I mean it really depends on at what layer you want to share things. Um, so if you have some if you have some application that you want to. Uh, share with other another institution. Yeah, I mean it, it would it would largely depend on your app and how your app handles identity. I mean, because because Slate is really operating sort of more at the infrastructure level, right? It's giving you the ability to launch an application, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't take any strong stances about how your app does 
you know, authentication and authorization. So you'd have to build that into your app. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So, um, so, so these are sort of the roles in the in the Slate Federation, um, and these are kind of uh, not just specific to um, not just specific to the Slate uh, project. These are kind of more generally uh, what we imagine as the the roles being in the sort of federated operations model. Um, so essentially, you have a, a platform uh, administrator, which is the the person or group of persons that uh, run in our in our case the the Slate software, the API server, the catalog, um, on the backing store for all of that stuff. Um, you have an edge administrator who is somebody that is running a cluster that's participating in the federation. Application administrators are folks that are running an application on one or more participating clusters uh, in the federation. You have an application developer who is actually putting apps into the catalog. Uh, a reviewer that um, just checks to see that those applications coming into the catalog are consistent, see consistent with the policy and quality standards of that catalog. Um, they may choose, for example, to bounce that application back to the developer to make some changes, that sort of thing. And then ultimately, the you know, if all goes well, the application is merged into the catalog. Um, and then you know, anybody who, who grants access to using that application can use it on clusters in the Federation. Um, and so the Slate catalog fundamentally is uh, based off of the popular packaging tool Helm. Um, so the idea is that um, we want to abstract away, you know, a lot of the Kubernetes specifics for our users, because a lot of the people coming into this aren't necessarily Kubernetes experts. Um, they're, they're more interested in running their particular application um, you know, they, they want to do something like run a global store, run a person or a test point or whatever. Um, and so we've also tried to take a very uh, kind of security conscious approach to packaging applications for Slate. Um, we found that, you know, there, there's a number of different uh, deployments for uh, setting up Kubernetes clusters. Um, you kind of have these very uh, open and sort of liberal uh, uh, tools like kubeadm, right, where not a lot of security policies or things like that are set up by default. It's kind of, um, you know, you, you build a cluster, it has some, um, you know, reasonable defaults. And then if you want to add in security, you have to, you know, fold all that in. On the other side of the spectrum, you have things like OKD, uh, which are very, very security conscious out of the box. You can't do things like run things as root. There's all these security policies applied places, you know, you have SE Linux, all of that stuff. Um, and so we've tried to take the, the, the Slate catalog and uh, build applications in such a way that um, we sort of uh, try to build in as much of that security stuff as we can, as is reasonable in an application. Um, so for example, um, one thing that if you, if you just go out there on, into, the, into the world and, and look for a Helm package, um, for something innocuous like Postgres, um, you might see that you know you can you can pull down the Postgres configuration and it gives you all these options for the database, um, and then it also allows you to do things like change the container image. Um, in the Slate world, you know things like that can't work um, without introducing very large holes into the model. Um, so, for example, if you downloaded Postgres and you uh, you changed uh, Postgres's container image to some Bitcoin miner or something like that, you could imagine uh, folks would go out there and then deploy that uh, you know on a bunch of clusters that are registered in Slate. And so you know, that's obviously a non-starter. Um, and so that's you know, part of the reason why we keep this this kind of app store of uh, of, of applications that we know uh, work well and are uh, kind of locked down a little bit. And this isn't bulletproof, but it's a, it's a step forward in, in trying to protect the supply chain for applications. Um, okay, so what does it actually look like to deploy an app in Slate? Um, so this, this is an example for uh, Globus. Um, 
And so here on the on the left, this is kind of what a user sees when they're trying to deploy a global store through Slate. Um, they can they have a few configurables here that they can they can poke around with. They can change like what paths uh, can be read. Um, they can change port ranges, that sort of thing. Um, they can say, you know, oh, I want the default directory to be my home directory or whatever. Um, and then they can plug in an identity method like security, uh, like a CI logon. And then over here on the right, um, all of that gets templated out into the, the Kubernetes object YAML, but none of this stuff is ever directly exposed to users. Um, Lincoln, is the, yes. um, the uh, description on the left, is that a CRD? Uh, the, the left, this is, that's the, uh, that's the Helm templating. Okay, the Helm yeah. template, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, this, this shouldn't look too terribly different. Um, what you do in Slate is you, you create your secrets that are, that are needed to instantiate your global store, for example. Um, you get some configuration, um, you edit it appropriately for whatever you wanna do, and then you can run the Slate app install command. Um, you give it your configuration file, uh, what cluster you want to run it at, and 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 what group it's going to run under. Um, and then in five to ten minutes, you know, Slate will, um, you know, essentially have your global store running. It's going to contact the Kubernetes cluster that you want to deploy on. Um, it's going to instantiate the objects and download the container. All this happens at the Kubernetes level. Um, and then the pod starts up, and you know, users can activate the global store. You see, I love them. And if they ever want to, you know. Upgrade to the latest and greatest version of that application. You know they can do something like a slate instance restart uh, and get the latest version. And so, in general, we're trying to build um, build up sort of trust relationships with various organizations uh, to build uh, containerized applications. So we don't have to do all of the <laughs> building of the containers in house. Um, and so, you know, Helm charts that are in the slate catalog can also refer to images that are in trusted repositories. Uh, you know, such as those operated by like the Open Science Grid or CERN or whatever. Um, one of the things that we uh, found while using Kubernetes for a while uh, is that using some kind of version control, specifically using some kind of implementation of GitOps, uh, is actually hugely important. Um, we think it's 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 uh, super necessary to be able to track like when changes are made. Um, you know to have people be able to make like pull requests against a configuration, especially if you're working with uh, like junior members of a team um, so they can you know have that reviewed and get feedback. Um, so you can do things like roll back bad deployments and, 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 and overall, so you can have kind of a single source of truth for your cluster state. Um, you know, if you aren't using something like GitOps, it can be kind of hard to, uh, you know, know sort of the provenance of, of where things are coming into your, into your cluster. Um, and I, you know, I personally think that you know, if using Kubernetes without some kind of version control based um, system for your Kubernetes objects is a little bit like running you know, your servers without some kind of configuration management tool. Um, and so what we did for Slate, because it operates at a slightly different layer than a lot of these uh, GitOps tools is that we made this GitOps overlay, um, which I like to call Slate flavored GitOps. Um, and the idea is that we can track all the configuration for your slate clusters, uh, for all the applications on all your slate clusters, and do things like send notification when changes are made, that sort of thing. Um, another thing that we're working on is a um, an award called uh, Soteria, which is basically the the idea is that you know in the container world is is really susceptible to supply chain attacks, um, and that's not just a concern for you know, IT professionals. That's also a concern for uh, folks running um, scientific applications in containers because they do have that, um, you know, uh, the, the sources of their containers could be possibly compromised. Um, and when they're running services or running applications, you know, they could, they could possibly uh, open the door to, to malicious activity. Um, and so there's a number of things that we're, we're looking at here, like, you know, container images are kind of less immutable than they first appear. If you're running, um, you know, some application tagged with version one out of Docker Hub, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the exact same container image tomorrow. Uh, or likewise, if you run, you know, an application with the latest tag, um, that's constantly uh, mutating and, and becoming something different. Um, 
it's also doesn't seem to be all that common, although it's becoming more common um, that the you know, image shining, things like that are, are not super popular just yet. Um, and so we're building a service uh, that's essentially a container registry for science. Um, and Soteria has a very long acronym, but it stands for Securing an Open and Trustworthy Ecosystem for Research Infrastructure and Applications. Um, and essentially what it is is a distributed harbor service um, we have a uh, sort of harbor running at, at the, the University of Wisconsin-Madison and harbor running at the University of Chicago. Um, and we're you know, hosting this service for folks to upload containers into, um, and it can serve those containers um, as a container registry. And we'll also do some uh, container analysis via these sort of standard tools out there like Trippy. Um, that are just going to you know take your container run some analysis against it and then just present you with all the things it found we're not going to necessarily say like these are good containers these are bad containers but we're just going to you know provide that information um, to people that would be interested in looking at it um, and we're also providing some capabilities for distribution um, like doing some things like taking docker containers and automatically converting them to you know singularity format or automatically populating a, a CVMFS repository so they can be distributed um, and that sort of thing. And so what this means for Slate is that Slate applications are sort of evolving. Uh, and the way I see it is that Slate ultimately will be, you know, Helm charts and packaging for applications. And so here will be more about the like container image creation, you know, analyzing containers, signing containers and, and distributing them. Um, so another example of, of Slate in the wild is uh, job gateways. So in the open science grid, there's this hosted service called the hosted C, uh, compute entry point or hosted CE. Um, and essentially what that is, is a microservice that lives out there in the world. Um, and it facilitates uh, batch access to institutional clusters. Um, and so OSG is using Slate uh, to deploy these hosted CEs um, to join uh, you know, many disparate clusters into the uh, into the open science pool, and and also to do this for various collaborations. And so I believe there's a there's a hosted CE pointing to NERSC that I, I think the, the CMS experiment is using. Um, we did the you know similar things at TAC, um, lots of other institutions. Um, and so this is a really uh, interesting and, and cool use of, of Slate out there. Can I just ask a question then? So yeah. Uh, so the, the hosted C is pointing to these places, right? Yeah, but it's deployed at some other place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so another uh, example of, of, uh, of Slate out there in the wild is uh, one of kind of our original uh, motivation for doing this is, is building, you know, a content delivery network. Um, and so in, in US Atlas, we're using Slate to deploy caches uh, in the US and in Europe. Um, and these caches are kind of, um, you know, improving our, our data access um, uh, across the board. Um, and so all these are managed by uh, a single person, essentially, uh, who can go in and uh, update and, and uh, reconfigure and restart uh, caches that are really, ge uh, really geographically distributed. Um, so what does that look like? Um, it looks really similar to the Globus example. This is just a YAML file here on the right. Uh, this is just the, the Helm template. Um, you just plug in things like, oh, these are the cache directories I want. I want to put the metadata on this SSD over here, high and low watermarks, usual caching stuff. Um, from the Slate side, the operator uploads and encrypts a uh, X509 certificate. So in Slate, all the, all the secrets are, uh, are encrypted at rest. Um, and uh, they deploy an instance to a cluster. You know, they feed in the, the group and cluster information where they want to run this. Um, and then they can just sort of use the usual tools to restart instances or delete things or look at logs, that sort of thing. Um, so Xcache is, is deployed and managed via GitOps. So all that application uh, configuration just lives in this, in this GitHub repository that's out there on the web. Um, and so whenever somebody makes a change, or rather when a when a pull request comes in as merged or somebody makes a change directly to the, to the repo, who's one of the main contributors, um, that fires up a GitHub action and then Slate goes in and updates the, uh, the instance that's running on somebody's Kubernetes cluster somewhere. And it sends an email saying, you know, oh, I did this uh, to let everybody know that you know, something was changed in the, in, the, in the cluster state. 
Um, and yeah, and so when site operators have to do maintenance or whatever, they can and do uh, make pull requests against this repo when uh, site specific updates are needed. There was a, a pull request I was just looking at earlier where you know administrator said, oh, this disk is dead, I need to replace it. So they sent a pull request to remove that that disk out of the cache. And uh, you know once that was merged, they were able to do the maintenance. Um, more broadly, in the US Atlas computing facility, uh, we've equipped all of our tier two sites with Kubernetes, uh, a small Kubernetes cluster, and we've installed Slate on all of them. And uh, we're doing some federated service management on those clusters. And so fundamentally, each of the sites is responsible for running their own stuff um, and, uh, and keeping the operating system and, and Kubernetes up to date. And then we have this FedOps team above that that uh, is essentially responsible for keeping the applications up to date. We're, we're running two applications, one is Squid and one is Xcache. Um, and both of these applications are configured to use Slate GitOps. So there's a single GitHub repository uh, that stores all the configuration uh, that's needed. Well, a single GitHub repository per application uh, that's storing all the config needed uh, for each site. And then ultimately the Slate team uh, is responsible for making sure that Helm, Helm charts and Docker containers and all that stuff are reasonably up to date. You know, you know, regularly rebuild them, that sort of thing, just to make sure that they don't have any glaring vulnerabilities. Um, and so ultimately, you get the same management interface for two different applications, operated by two different teams, um, partitioned in namespaces so they can't interfere with each other on these Kubernetes nodes, and uh, we shift some of that responsibility up to um, up a higher level. And so our traditional tier two site, um, you know, looks like something on the left where you, you know, you have a bunch of hardware and install the OS and you set up your puppet thing. Um, and then you have to figure out how to, you know, run all these applications that the collaboration has asked you to run. And so under this new model, the idea is that the site admins just run the hardware, they run the operating system, they run Kubernetes, and you know, ultimately that becomes the limit of what they need to manage uh, in order to run their site. And then there are these FedOps teams that run these different services uh, on behalf of the collaboration. Um, and then you have things like Slate and Spateria that are concerned with the stuff in the middle, like the Helm charts and the containers and that sort of thing. Uh, we also find that a lot of applications these days are sort of going cube native in the high energy physics community. There's been a lot of interest in building um, what people are calling Pythonic analysis platforms. Um, so these are essentially Jupyter driven uh, with really easy to use libraries for data access and data processing. Um, and these platforms have kind of fundamentally been developed with Kubernetes in mind. Um, it'd be really actually pretty difficult to reproduce them outside of Kubernetes because they, you know, have a number of things going on, like they have, uh, you know, message queues, and object stores, and, and, uh, and databases and all this stuff um, that would be, you know, a pretty significant ask if you were to go to a site and ask, you know, a system administrator to set all this stuff up for you. Um, we're, we're supporting two of those today, um, not directly in Slate, but in some of our Kubernetes resources. Um, one of them is called ServiceX, which is designed to sort of skim and slim input data, transform it into um, Pyro for these like columnar analyses um, and deliver it in notebooks. There's also this tool called Coffee Casa, which is a Jupyter Hub solution that uh, integrates with Dask uh, and, uh, and experiment IDP. So you can like log into Coffee Casa as an, if you're an Atlas physicist, you can log into the system and get a notebook and do some work, submit things out to Dask and it, uh, you know, integrates it all very nicely into, into one Jupyter environment. Um, so how could how could Slate benefit NERSC users? Um, I would say that in Slate, we have this sort of catalog of applications that we think work reasonably well. Our focus has been mostly on building things that are relatively stateless. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with building out caching applications, um, facilitating file transfer through things like Globus, um, we've been trying to integrate things like Personar, plus some other uh, interesting tools like Open On Demand, those sort of things. Um, and as a person who is working with the Atlas experiment and, and using, you know, uh, NERSC machines as, as an end user, um, you know, I have a couple applications that I can imagine deploying into Kubernetes. Uh, for me, of course, preferably via Slate. Um, we have things like workload management tools where we're pulling down jobs from 
um, you know, uh, the, the global job system. Um, and then we need to transform them in some way and submit them to Cori or submit them to Perlmutter. Um, we also have these data transfer tools, um, things like uh, this XCache software that I mentioned, where we want to just kind of uh, run a bunch of jobs and then have the cache sort of pull down the data on the fly uh, and uh, and cache it locally to improve job efficiency, that sort of thing. Um, there's a number of ways we could approach this. Um, one way is that we could, for example, add slight capability to a Kubernetes cluster at NERSC. Um, we could also, if we had to, you know, deploy things in a detached manner, um, as I mentioned, you know, Slate applications are just Helm applications. And so it's possible to just render out the Helm templates and then install them kind of in the usual way with kubectl. Um, then of course, from a user perspective, I sort of lose the, um, you know, the advantage of having things in my, my GitOps and all that stuff, but it's doable. Um, for data transfer, you know, we're mostly sending data to and from NERSC via Globus, um, you know, which has its own, you know, things that we have to do. We have to have a bunch of plugins that are running in our, our workflow management uh, tool. Um, we have to go in and, you know, periodically refresh our Globus credentials and all that stuff. Um, we also have some applications that we're running on DTNs just by um, you know, we, we have an unprivileged account on a DTN and we can run some data transfer tools, that sort of thing. Um, but what we really would like, um, which would really make our lives easier, and I suspect the lives of a lot of other collaborations a lot easier, um, is to have some kind of DTN-like capability attached uh, to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and I think in general, this would be really uh, enabling for folks that are doing things like wanting to run science gateways, right? Because you could imagine that they might have a, a Kubernetes app that, that uh, handles staging and data from some data federation, and maybe it submits a job to one of your clusters using your super facility API, and then you know, it makes the results available for an end user to download, or it makes, you know, it, it moves those results out the, you know, somewhere else so they can be collected and that sort of thing. Um, so finally to the end. Um, so in summary, uh, you know, we're kind of betting that Kubernetes-based service platforms adjacent to large-scale HPCs are going to become very commonplace. Um, we know that scientific uh, collaborations are going to continue to need to build these bespoke distributed applications to support their workflows. And so we think that there is a policy, there's a need for a policy framework and a mechanism to implement that framework. Um, and build this kind of fabric of services, um, you know, to, to, to sort of insert this, uh, this substrate for collaborations to be able to build their applications. Um, and we think that, you know, if, if we can shift some of the application operator responsibility to developers of applications, um, rather than, uh, you know, putting that on onto the sysadmin at every site uh, to kind of learn how to use these applications and, and join them up and maintain them. Um, we think that we can ultimately lower um, some of the labor costs for doing these things. And uh, yeah, and lastly, you know, extending Kubernetes clusters with DTN capabilities, I think would be would be very useful for many collaborations. And there's our contact information for Slate. Uh, we have a weekly working call on Wednesdays at three. So we be happy to have anybody join and, and talk more about this stuff. Thanks a lot, Lincoln. So I, if folks have questions, they can just simply unmute themselves and ask. I guess in the meantime, while folks uh, formulate ideas or questions, I, I would wonder if you could um, elaborate a little bit more about the uh, capabilities of the data transfer node that are needed for the science gateways that you see that are not um, available, say on say something like spin in existence today. Is it just, it just simply that you need higher bandwidth? Um, you need yeah. science gateway mm -hmm. capability that. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we would we would love to be able to you know transfer files into in into NERSC, you know, through some Kubernetes application. At, you know, multiple tens of gigabits. Um, I realize that there are some challenges potentially with, um, you know, doing doing user accounts and things like that, making sure that the the accounts running in a container are going to match up with the accounts and groups and stuff that are that are present in the file system. So there's, you know, it's not without challenges. 
Um, but yeah, do, doing that sort of thing would be would be really useful. Um, admittedly, I haven't tried to do any kind of you know large transfers through spin and things like that, so I don't know um, you know what the limits of that are. Um, but in general, I could see it as being a, a useful thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I can just comment. I, I mean, I think it could be useful too. Um, I mean, there's probably some reasons why, I mean, like, you know, there would be a different security model that SPIN is currently kind of protected by a firewall and part of the point of science DMZ and DTNs is they're a little more open, I guess, for bandwidth and performance reasons. Uh, I would just say on your on the workflow that you described, I mean, if you're using the super facility API, then you can initiate via that API a transfer, which would happen with Globus uh, on the DTNs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can still construct that portal and workflow. Uh, but I, if you want to run something other than Globus, then I think it would be convenient if you could have your own container yeah. within Spin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I see Stefan uh, decloaked, so he might have a comment as well. No, no, I'm just uh, just decloaked so, so I can pay attention more closely. Uh, yeah, no, I think well, I think Spin generally does have a different security model. This is, I mean, this is there's a lot in this presentation. It's very interesting, so we should look into it more. Yeah, I mean, I had a bit of a question about when you say integrating Slate into a Kubernetes cluster, uh, like you know, what would it take to bring Slate into Spin? Yeah, uh, for example. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I would be very interested. I, I don't know if you have like a, a, a development spin or a production spin, something like that, if you have any anything. Like, for example, I know that, that it's, it's using Rancher. Um, you know, we haven't, we haven't tried things with Rancher in, in quite some time. So there's, there's, there's one, just the technical thing of, you know, can, can we install the Slate Federation controller and have it talk to your cluster? Uh, and then there's the separate kind of policy thing of like, you know, do, does, uh, you know, the policies we've, we've laid out, right, and, and how all this stuff work, you know, is, is that sufficient for, you know, cybersecurity folks, right? Is there something more that they want? Uh, having that kind of conversation would be really interesting too. Yeah, so Spin uses a uh, rancher, which has its own RBAC. So, you know, that's like one of the places where I'd be concerned. I mean, the devils are in the details here. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. There's a. Uh, um, and then I could see there's some other, other pieces that look like they would be probably easier to integrate um, more the, on the helm level of, uh, of uh, deploying an application. But again, uh, we'd want to look at it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it seems like even if it wasn't fully integrated, there might be some advantage in pulling services because we're running squids and stuff within spin. So, you know, being able to pull from the same repository, yeah. like things that work elsewhere right. might be useful. Yeah, you know, I mean, if right. you have the ability to use, you know, Helm somewhere, I, I don't know if Rancher has any integration for Helm, but you one, one way you can use Slate is to, to simply add the Slate catalog in as a Helm repository into your, you know, into your Helm config. Yeah, um, um, we've been struggling with using Helm just uh, for mostly for, because um, we would have to basically provide a catalog of like vetted, vetted applications and you know, yeah. like our role would be like get pull and then like change a couple lines and then get pushed to our own app, um, yeah. repository and just keep that in sync all the time. And that was uh, uh, just, not something we could handle at the, at the time. It is something we are discussing um, a lot more yeah. now. Um, but I think having another catalog uh, where people already did that would be uh, great. Um, so like yeah. one of those things we struggle a lot with with Helm is, um, you know, Helm just kind of assumes, or a lot, most of the applications in Helm just assume that you're root and that's okay. Yeah. Um, and that's not something we're okay with. So we had, you know, we have, um, uh, we really limit capabilities. Uh, where possible while still allo allowing helm and then just lots of lots of applications just don't work without out of the box so we have to like do some deep dives and to fix things yeah and that, that's we haven't we haven't done a ton of work here but one of the things that we've thought about is like you know, we, sh we should build our helm applications assuming the most restrictive set of <laughs> security policies if we can and then yeah if, if it works in that restrictive subset then it should work and, and more uh, freewheeling clusters. 
Yeah, and like just even like two years ago, that would have been a really difficult proposition. Um, just I think just uh, the Kubernetes community just hasn't been super security minded, um, yeah. and so I think that's getting taken much more seriously now. Yeah, it is, and I think a lot of that is related to how you know you you go and get a Kubernetes cluster on you know GKE or whatever, right? And it's it's really just like a single tenant, kind of narrowly focused. We assume you know what you're going to do kind of thing um and and in in our community we're really trying to use it as a as a multi-tenant thing and so you know we have to keep all these security things in mind yeah i think it's a different level of multi-tenancy i mean amazon doesn't really care too much if your application gets hacked because it's You're contained to your, it's contained within your like little aws yeah. realm and so it's different uh in the multi-tenant environment like we have um and Amazon and Google aren't really tempted to, to uh, uh, solve that problem because they make more money if they sell, you know, if they have a, if they have one cluster with 10 people in it, they make less money than if they have 10 clusters with one person on it. Um, so, and, and, and also just like Kubernetes in general has a lot of, I think, cloud bias um, and on-premise is a lot harder. So, yep. This is really neat to see uh, what, what you've what you've done. Um, it's it's very different than what it was a few years ago. So, a much broader federation. Do folks have any other questions? I had one um, for the sites where you've deployed the um, I think it was the Atlas example. You said, you know, what did these deployments look like from a infrastructure standpoint resources so for x caches those are probably the more heavyweight of the two um so for x cache what we've asked sites to do is um essentially go buy a machine that has you know a couple hundred gigabytes of ram and you know at least 10 disks and put them in jbot and uh you know mount them to some well-known location and then communicate that to the the, the team running the Xcache application of like all these things. Um, and then, you know, they also have to have like some SSDs and things like that. Um, so, I mean, from a, yeah, so from a resource perspective, you know, we've, we've asked them to buy a reasonably powerful, you know, DTN sort of machine uh, with some built-in disks and, and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's just one BP node generally. Yeah, at these at these sites, it's kind of you know we we planted the seeds everywhere, um, and then the idea is that now we have the the substrate out there, um, and then when we have the next application that comes along, right, we'll already have all of the sort of initial work done of getting these clusters up and running. Uh, we can run more applications there, and if we need to buy more hardware, we can we can grow those clusters. Thanks. There aren't any other questions then i think we will end early and uh, thank thank lincoln for his time yeah thanks for thanks for inviting me to come speak <laughs>